Welcome to the Organic Chemistry Podcast, Dr. Brian Lloyd's Scribblecast of Organic Chemistry Lectures and Solutions to Homework Problems. In this Scribblecast lecture, we're continuing with our study in stereochemistry. And specifically, we're going to look at the property of chirality. Chirality is a property that is a direct consequence of existing in three-dimensional space. In its simplistic sense, it could be related to the property of handedness, that is, the property of structures having left hand and right hand, or asymmetry in structure. The definition of chirality, or it, how chirality is defined for an object, is to say an object is chiral if it cannot be superimposed on its mirror image. Because it is a mirror image, the actual ordering of attached groups must be identical. Just the way these groups are attached. In the case of your hand, you are talking about the five digits, the fingers and thumb. Each palm has four fingers and a thumb. But uh, the arrangement of the thumbs in the two hands is different, allowing for the existence of what we call the left hand and the right hand. Now, in order to see if the same property exists in molecules, we need to draw a three-dimensional representation of a structure. Now, if we are looking at tetrahedrocarbon, and we're going to draw a three-dimensional image, we need some definitions for how we draw the bonds. Bonds that are drawn with straight lines are those bonds which exist in the plane of the board. Since we're going to represent the three-dimensional tetrahedron, uh, tetrahedral carbon, we represent car uh, atoms coming out of the plane of the board with wedges, either hollow or usually they're filled with color. I may not color them all. So this wedge would represent this atom coming out towards you. Atoms that go into the plane of the board, that is, they're not in the plane, are represented by dashed lines. So suppose we had the following molecule. If we wanted to explore whether this molecule has a property of chirality, we would need to look at its mirror image. So the dotted line represents a mirror. And I would draw this molecules mirror image. So what I'm representing here is the mirror image of the left hand molecule. Now in order to understand whether this molecule has a property of chirality, we would have to take models of this molecule and rotate them, and the two molecules, rotate them and see if they are superimposable structures. In fact, it's not hard to imagine taking this molecule and rotating it about this axis, so we'd swing these BRs around. This BR would come out front and this BR would be behind, but the I would swing right around, and we would get the exact same structure. So since these two structures are superimposable, this molecule would not be said not to have the property of chirality. Now, if you lack the property of chirality, the molecule is said to be achiral. Achiral, if you like, is the proper term for the expression not chiral. It is a lack of handedness. That is, there's enough symmetry in the molecule that there is no chirality. It would be as if your hand had two thumbs on either side, so that your single hand would be both left and right-handed simultaneously. 
this molecule lacks the property of uh, chirality. Well, let's look at another example. And I'm going to just make a change to the structure. I'm going to change the bromine going into a board into a chlorine. And that would make this bromine a chlorine. Now, if I do that, and we rotate the molecule about this axis, what's going to happen? Well, certainly I can take my models and uh, using different colored bonds, use a different color for each atom. And you could do that. You could make both structures and you could test if it's superimposable. But if I rotate this molecule about the axis, what's going to happen is this bromine that's coming out of the board, I swing it around. That bromine will swing to the position where it's going into the board. So I would get this. The chlorine would swing out, so it's coming out. So what I'm doing is rotating the molecule so I get it to a position. The iodine would now be in this position and the H would still be here if I swung around that axis. So if I did that rotation, you know, if I rotated it like that, approximately, oh, how many degrees would that be? Roughly 120, 240? <coughs> now, if I did that rotation, you can see, if you look carefully at this structure, that it does not line up with the original structure. So, although, okay, if you like, label this A, label this B, and call this B rotated, because it's the same thing, it's just B, and I've just spun it around. You can tell that B rotated is not structure A. So this molecule is non-superimposable on its mirror image. And because of that, it is chiral. Now, by looking at closely at what we had to do to induce the property of chirality, we had to generate a tetrahedral carbon atom with four different groups around it. And if you have four different groups around a tetrahedral carbon, you have the potential potentiality of having chirality. Now, we need to define some terms here. The first one is stereoisomers. All of our definitions that we are going to look at will utilize the term stereoisomer. So you must have an understanding of what the term stereoisomer means. Stereoisomers are isomers in which the atoms are linked together in the same order. the same order but are arranged differently in space.
stereoisomerism is a property of handedness or chirality. Your hands match this definition. In place of atoms, we could use digits or projections off the palm. The five projections attached to the palm are four fingers and a thumb. Both hands have four fingers and a thumb attached to a palm, so one could say the same units are attached to the palm, so they have the same order. It's just those units are arranged differently. The thumb and small fingers are on the opposite sides of the palm, and so the two hands become stereoisomers. If you were to step away from that analogy and apply it to the carbon atom, in our last example where we had the chiral carbon with the chlorine, bromine, iodine, and hydrogen, both carbons had the same form for groups around them. Both mirror images had the iodine, bromine, chlorine, and hydrogen around the carbon. These groups were just arranged differently so as to generate mirror images that were non-superimposable. Now, with this, we can define a new term called an antimer. We begin the definition of an antimer with the word stereoisomer. And an antimer, or an antimers, an antimer is a stereoisomer. So what that means is you're comparing it to another molecule that is virtually identical. It has the same groups around it. It has atoms that are linked together in the same order. So it has to be the same atoms around the carbon and they're attached, the same atoms attached to the same carbon. They're just arranged differently. And an antimer is a stereoisomer that is non-superimposable. Non-superimposable upon its mere image or on its mere image. Okay. There is another term which is called diastereomers. I bring it up now because the definition is almost identical to an anti. A diastereomer is a stereoisomer that is non superimposable. but not, if you like, not mere images. Now this, this definition really shows why you have to have the term stereoisomer used in these. See, this has to be some kind of structure that has the exact same groups around the carbons, but they're not mirror images, and they are non-superposable. Now, it's hard to imagine that, but we have actually had one special case of that, and that was a special case of a special type of diastereomer, a diastereomer that's caused by hindered rotation. They are geometric isomers. And let's draw a small example, a simple example of this 
geometric isomerism and see if it fits the diastereomer definition. So I'm going to draw two geometric isomers. Here is the molecule 2-butene or but-2-ene. Here is its geometric isomer. This is also 2-butene. The one I'm going to label A, we know, is the cis isomer. The one labeled B is the trans isomer. And they're called geometric isomers because this isomerism is a direct result of hindered rotation about the double bond. But look closely at the two molecules. Ask yourself, are there mirror images? Is there any way I could draw a mirror between them? or maybe underneath or above that would reflect the one molecule and give you the other as a reflection? Well, you see, if you look carefully, there is no mirror image. Are they stereoisomers? That is, does each atom have the same groups essentially attached to it? Well, let's take a look. The CH3, CH3, we have a C, the left-hand C with a double bond. It has a double bonded carbon, an H, and a CH3. That's the same, an H, CH3, double bond. Go to the right-hand double bond carbon, a C, a CH3, a double bond C, an H. It's double bond to C, H, CH3, the same. Every atom essentially is linked together to other atoms in the relatively same order. What is different is the arrangement in space. So A and B are stereoisomers. So, so far we've met two of the three criteria for diastereomers. They're stereoisomers and they're not mirror images. Now here's the question, are they superimposable? Well, obviously they're not. So geometric isomers are an example of diastereomer. They're not the only example of diastereomers we're going to see. We will be coming to other types of diastereomers that don't depend on hindered rotation for their isomerism. Okay. Now, chiral chirality can be defined, as we stated earlier, as that property that an object possess possesses that allows it to be chiral. That is the property of not being superimposable on this mirror image. So the chirality itself is a property which permits a compound to exist as a pair of enantiomers. It is the fact that there is an inherent handedness in the structure, if you like. The left hand and the right hand. That property which per permits the compounds to exist as a pair of enantiomers. Well, then, what are the requirements for chirality. The requirements for Well, the first requirement, or better, the safest way to confirm chirality is to make a model. Take a molecular model kit and actually build a model. And then build its mirror image and then examine to see if the compounds are superimposable or not. If they're superimposable, they're the same thing. If they're not superimposable, then you have chirality of that. Let's write that down. 
So if not superimposable, and remember that's for stereoisomers and we're talking about the mirror images. So if they're not superimposable, then they are chiral. And if you were working with mirror images and the stereoisomers, then you have an antimers. However, if it is superimposable, so if superimposable, If superimposable, the molecule then is achiral, which means not chiral. The pair of molecules have not got chirality because they are superimposable, and it's the same a molecule. They're identical. Now, what is the alternative method for confirming chirality, or what is the requirement? In order to be chiral, the molecule must lack a center of symmetry and a plane of symmetry. So it's got to lack either a center of symmetry and or cannot have a center of symmetry to be chiral. Or, and, the molecule must lack center of symmetry and a plane of symmetry. Now, in the case of a carbon atom that is tetrahedral, to achieve this condition, it requires that you have four different groups around the carbon atom. If the molecule has a center of symmetry or a plane of symmetry, it will be achiral. Okay. So what structures are actually capable of existing? What structures are actually capable of existing as an antimers? So structures that can exist Well, the first structure, of course, is the chiral atom. Now, as I've stated, any atom that has four different groups around it, okay, can be chiral. So, any sp cubed atom bonded to four different substituents Any 
atom bonded to four different substituents is chiral. And note, it's very important to note that one of those substituents can be a lone pair. So lone pairs count as the substituents. Let's look at an example of a case of a chiral atom. that has a lone pair in it. What if I had the following amine? So there's its lone pair. And I'm going to give, going into the board, a CH3. And a wedge coming out of the board. And let's make that a CH2, CH3. And then over here in the plane of the board, we have an H. So the lone pair is actually in the plane of the board as well. Now let's consider its mirror image. So this atom has four different groups about it, and so the nitrogen could be said to be chiral. So I'm gonna put a mirror plane here, and I'm gonna draw its reflection. So here, I'm reflecting. There we go. Put a carbon. And over here will be the methyl. And then here will be the H. And of course, um, that's not carbon, is it? That should be a nitrogen. And then the lone pair is pointed down. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw this right over here, the same mirror image structure. Now, here's a question. What is the hybrid orbital number of nitrogen? Remember the way you determine the HON to determine hybridization? Well, we count up the number of atoms and lone pairs around nitrogen, and we get an HON of 4. What hybridization has an HON of 4? Well, that's sp cubed. And that's why we've drawn it tetrahedral. But why does nitrogen adopt the sp cubed hybridization? Well, again, again according to valence shell pair electron, valence shell electron pair repulsion theory, BESPER, it adopts sp cubed to get the groups and lone pair as far apart as possible. So an sp squared hybridization, for example, let's just draw that here. An sp squared hybridization is not adopted because it's higher energy. If I was to draw an sp squared, it would look something like this. And let's make the 2p orbital a different color. So I'll make the 2p red so you can tell that this guy's sp squared. So there we go. And let's put the lone pair in the 2p. Now, why is this not the shape of the molecule? Well, the fact is, this is not the shape of the molecule because sp squared is higher energy. What's interesting to note is that at room temperature, 
there is enough energy for the molecule to go sp squared. In other words, all it has to do is lift up these groups a bit and rehybridize that sp cubed orbital into a 2p, and it's in this shape. Now, because it's higher energy, it won't stay there long, and it can go back. But what's interesting is when it goes back, who's to say whether the three groups bend down or bend up? And you can see if the three groups bend up, we have generated this guy, which is the enantiomer. So what does this state? Normally, enantiomers cannot interconvert. It would be like, just like if your left hand could turn into a right hand because the thumb migrates through the center of the palm. The lone pair electrons migrate into or rehybridize into a 2p and then the sp cubed could be pointing in the other direction. Now, this only can happen when you have a lone pair around the atom. And note that if you're working with carbon, which has four atomic groups around it, it can't go through this type of rehybridization. This process is called the inversion of a chiral center. version of a chiral center. What is the consequence of this inversion process? Well, let me ask you a question. What would the consequence be if you went to bed at night and your thumb could migrate through the palm of your hand? What would the consequence would be is you would wake up and you'd never know if that hand was going to be a right hand or a left hand at any given moment. Effectively, you'd lose your handedness. You'd never know which hand to stick out because at any given moment, the thumb may be on the other side of the palm. The consequence of losing handedness is like losing chirality. If you like, because of this inversion, the amine system becomes a chiral. So what is this amine an example of? Well, this amine is an example of a molecule that has a chiral atom. The atom has four different groups around it. It is chiral. It has a chiral atom, but because of inversion, because of inversion, the molecule becomes achiral, or it behaves as if it's achiral. If you isolate a pure enantiomer and you leave one of these enantiomers on the shelf, the next thing you know is you have a mixture of enantiomers in your bottle because of the inversion process. Well, does this apply to all amines? Is there any way that we could make an amine, for example, that can avoid this type of behavior? The following amine cannot undergo the inversion process, so I'll draw the lone pair. And hopefully you can tell me why.
If you look carefully at this molecule, what has happened is that the three groups attached to the nitrogen all connected by carbons to this one carbon. In so doing, those three groups are anchored behind the carbon. So these groups can't flip up to the other side because they're pinned to this carbon. So this molecule right here is an example of a chiral amine that can't undergo the inversion. And so it would be not superimposable upon its mirror image, just like the other amine, but it can't interconvert to it. And because of that, it stays chiral. It is an example of an amine with a chiral atom that is a chiral molecule. And you should know this example. So amines have this special case of inversion which can allow a molecule that has a chiral atom to become achiral and behave as this it is not chiral. Well, are there any examples of structures that you can have chiral molecules with no chiral atoms? Okay, so let's get some examples. Molecules that are chiral with no chiral atoms. Well, the first one in this category is what we call the chiral allene. A chiral allene has two accumulated double bonds. Now, before I draw the chiral allene, I want you to consider a simple alkene. If I draw an alkene, it turns out that the four groups around the double bond lie in the same plane. So if I was to draw something like this, and what you get is what we call EZ or cis-trans isomerism. And that isomerism exists because these four groups are in the same plane. Okay. But what if you put two double bonds together? Well, what happens then is the outer carbons are sp squared hybridized. But the central carbon, because it only has two atoms attached to it, is sp hybridized. Now to produce a pi bond, if the p orbitals that overlap this way, okay, if those p orbitals are used to make this pi bond, then to make the other double bond, the central carbon must use a p orbital that's coming out. So this carbon has to be tilted. Now, if it tilts, it's going to have its hydrogens oriented differently. And to be correct, this, if this was straight up and down, this H would be going into the board. This chlorine would be coming out. Okay. Now, that would mean this H is in the plane of the board, and that Cl is in the plane of the board. So what that means is these two groups, the H 
and the CL here line the plane of the board, these two are coming, one going out, one going into the board. They're lying in a perpendicular plane. These two groups are not coplanar like when you have a double bond. If you like, they're tilted. Okay, so the consequence of a chiral alene structure is that you lose the coplanarity of the two groups off the ends. Whereas in a single double bond system, they were coplanar, they no longer are. And this means you lose EZ isomerism and you get handedness. Because if you make the mirror image, you make the mirror image, and you take the time to build the model, you will find that these two structures are non-superimposable. They're stereoisomers because they have the same groups, you know, hydrogen, chlorine, carbon, then a double bond of carbon, but they're, and the mirror images, they're just non-superposable. That means these two are enantiomers, but no, there is no chiral carbon. There is no carbon that has four different groups around it. Chiral allenes are an example of chirality without a carbon atom, and you should be able to draw them and make note of that. The next example that we want to look at of chirality without a chiral carbon really grows out of cyclic alkenes. Now what I want you to do is take a look at this molecule. Cyclohexene. Now let me ask you a question. For cyclohexene, why do we not call it cis-cyclohexene? You'll notice the two carbons coming off of the double bond here, here and here, are on the same side. The, the carbons uh, of the ring are on the same side. The two H's on the other side are opposites. Why do we not call this cis? Well, the reason is for the six carbon, there's no way to make that carbon attach to the opposite side and get trans. There's no such thing as trans cyclohexene. Now, the interesting point of all this is, well, how many carbons would I have to add here, 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 before I could wrap a chain? right around so it goes to the other side and you could get a transcyclic. Well, it turns out the answer to that is eight carbons. Now I'll make dots just to make the carbons of the ring stand out so you can tell it's eight carbons. This is cyclooctene cyclooctene in fact it is now appropriate to say cis cyclooctene because with eight carbons there is enough or there are enough carbons there are enough carbons to reach around and attached to the other side. That is, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. you could make the trans double bond and the chain can wrap right around one two three four five six seven eight 
Now the question is how can you draw this to properly show the molecule transcyclooctene? If you're going to draw transcyclooctene, start with the carbon-carbon double bond. And then place your H and your H on opposite sides. The H is off the double bond. So that you can place the CH2s of the ring off of the double bonds. Now, what you're going to do next is draw two C's thusly, and two C's this way. And then you're going to join up those last two C's with the ring reaching over the double bond. Put in H H H, and there is transcyclooctene. But now I want you to draw the mirror image. So if I draw the mirror image, I get an H down here. I get the CH2 here. The other end of the double bond, I have the H up and the CH2. I now draw my C's. And draw my line. Move that bond over. And I can put in my H2's. And here is the mirror image. What's interesting about this is that these two mirror images are non-superimposable. If you like, the handle loops around the other way. And so if these were both above the double bond, these CH2 linkages above the double bond, then you get them looping to the other side. Well, can't I just flip it? If you flip it, this loop that goes over the double bond will now be underneath. Whereas on this one, it's up on top. And there's no way to change that. And so the structures are never identical. And if you build the model, models, even though it's a fairly large molecule, you will see that transcyclooctene is non-superimposable upon its mirror image. Both structures have the exact same atoms around every atom. So they have the same bonding order, if you like. Same atoms bonded in the same order. The arrangement's just differently. And that result is transcyclooctene has a pair of enantiomers, mirror images that are non-superimposable. Stereoisomers that are mirror images that are non-superimposable. And that result is we have an, another example of a molecule that has no chiral atom. None of the carbons have four different groups around it. There's not a single chiral carbon. Here the chirality is a consequence of this ring being locked into a certain position around the double, double bond. And this is what creates the chirality. So this is chirality without a chiral atom. Now, the last thing to note is that this chirality okay, can also occur in helices. A helix is a coil that continues in one direction, if you like. I can put a mirror image and create a very crude helix, I admit, a coil in the opposite direction. Now, because helices, the actual coil of a helix, the actual coiled self of the helix is chiral. This means that long chain structures that utilize helices, because of the structure of the helix itself, become chiral. And do you 
where have you heard the term helix? Indeed, the double helix of DNA. Okay. These helices have the potential for chirality. And there is chirality because of the helix itself. Okay, so there you have some structures. Structures that actually have chirality without having a chiral atom. Now, what we're going to do next lecture is begin to carry out some tests for chiral chirality, and that test obviously being the building of models and checking if they're superimposable. And then we're going to generate a methodology for drawing these structures in two dimensions. And really, since I, you can see the problem even in this podcast, I'm not holding up the models. You cannot see me attempting to hold up these models. So it would be really nice if there was a way of drawing in two dimensions this three-dimensionality, this chirality effect. And so we're going to look at this in the next ScribbleCast lecture. So that's it. Thank you very much.